we are finally ready uh, to deal with the last proposition coming from neoclassical model of trade, and this is capture on proposition. Okay, and it goes like this. In a neoclassical framework with two final goods, two factors of production, and two countries with identical homothetic tastes, a country will export the goods, the goods that intensively uses the relatively abundant factor of production. Okay, it might seem a little bit complicated, so let's go through this slowly and explain the key points. Okay, in a neoclassical framework with two final goods, two factors of production and two countries, well, this is what we were dealing for the last 15 videos. So, I think uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. So, we, again, we have a very simple model with two goods, two factors of production in two countries. And now, we have with identical homothetic tastes. Okay, I just want to tell you a little bit about it because this is the main topic of this video. And, uh, of course, look, what we want to achieve in this model is to relate uh, relative abundance in factors of production with international trade flows, right? Differences in demand structure would cloud our reasoning, so we want to assume that preferences of customers are identical, and this is what we're going to do. But about this in detail a little bit later. And look, then we get a country will export the good that intensively uses the relatively abundant factor of production. Okay, let's now focus on this last part. So, we assume that we have two countries. Okay, so we were assuming we have Austria and Bolivia. Okay. Now, let's just say that capital to labor ratio in Austria is Ka over Ka, while in Bolivia it's Kb over Lb. Now, look, what you see over here is relatively abundant factor of production. When we call, talk about relative factor abundance, we actually think about capital to labor ratios. Because look, you can imagine that China will have more capital than the United States, but the United States has around 400 million people, while China around 2 million people. So, when you talk about the total capital in China, it will be bigger than the ones in the United States. Then, when you divide it uh, by the number of people, situation can change drastically. And this is the case that we want to consider. And look, we will be assuming that capital to labor ratio is higher in Austria. Okay, so what does Hatcher on proposition predict in this case? Well, it predicts that the country, that the country exports good that uses uh, intensively uh, the relatively abundant factor of production. So, Austria should export manufacturers, right? We've also assumed that the production of manufacturers is more capital intensive than production of food. On the other hand, Bolivia in this case is, uh, is relatively uh, more abundant in the labor. So we expect that Bolivia would be exporting food. Okay, and this prediction, uh, I think even intuitionally, should make a lot of sense to you. But we're going to derive it very carefully because this is the most important prediction of the now classical model of trade. Although, as we will discuss it later, uh, Stoffler Samuelson proposition. Uh, is the most controversial and had probably the biggest impact uh, on, on economic policy. Okay, so look, as we said before, what we want to do 
uh, over here uh, is to analyze the relationship between relative capital abundance or labor abundance, right? And uh, international trade flows. So what we are go what we are going to do here is that we want to uh, eliminate tests. So we will be assuming that customers have identical preferences in both countries. Okay. So generally, uh, we will be introducing for the first time into our model consumption. And look, consumption is also a key for exports because look, in our model, the long run model, exports will be given as production minus consumption. In this case, 
again, it would cloud everything that is important without actually bringing much to the table. So, let's introduce our regular budget constraint, the same one we've actually been using in the introduction to economic analysis. And look, if you don't remember some stuff about utility maximization, uh, in the link, uh, in the description of this video, you'll find the links uh, to introductions to economic analysis classes that will explain that. Okay, uh, so customer can spend his income on consumption of manufacturers, but of course, this uh, level of consumption, but of course, this is the quantity the customer consumes. So we also need to have a price of manufacturers. And of course, the customer can spend money in consumption of food, of course, times price of food. Okay, and now what we want to do here is to maximize utility given this restriction. So we do what we always do, and we use the Lagrange function. So we've got CM delta M C F. 1 minus delta M plus lambda I minus PM CM minus PF CF. Right, so just before with uh, minimization of cost, I've just introduced restriction over here. And now, of course, we need to differentiate Z. First, with respect to lambda, Okay, this is like more like a formality because here we're just getting the repetition of the constraint. This is equal to zero. But then we need to differentiate Z with respect to manufacturers and consumption of manufacturers and consumption of food. One right, then we will have CF one uh, minus delta M, and look out of this we get negative PM times lambda, so minus lambda PM, and this is equal to zero. And of course, look, it just uh, we can, we notice right away that we can take this negative lambda PM on the other hand side of the equation, and we end up with this. Just as over here, uh, it, it, just as over here, we will have the repetition of our constraint. Okay, and the last derivative we need to calculate is with respect to consumption of food, uh, and we get there that this is one minus delta m. Uh, C M delta M C F we subtract one so we've got just negative delta M and then out of this we get negative P F times lambda lambda times P F equals to zero and again we can perform the same trick right instead of writing equality here but just means double uh, the dot and we get this, right? Of course, then for now we just need those two, those two conditions and again I'm going to take the ratio of these two. So I'm getting that here I have uh, lambda pm over lambda pf which Clearly, we see we'll be canceling each other out, but maybe this is this a little later, and it is delta m c m delta m minus one c f one minus delta f over uh, one minus delta m c m delta m c f minus. Delta, uh, delta F. Okay, and 
now clearly see that those two cancel each other out, but we also see that here we have cm to the power delta m, cm to the power delta m, so those cancel each other out, we've just got cm to the power negative 1, right? And here we've got cf to the power negative delta f, so those two cancel each other out, and we've got just cf. So, out of this, um, out of this, we are obtaining that PM over PF uh, over PF is equal to delta M over 1 minus delta M uh, times CF uh, over CF. Oops. Now, let's do one simple thing and let's solve this expression for the value of consumption of food, right? Value of consumption of food is here because this is how many units of food we are consuming times their prices, right? Remember, we are... Uh, uh, okay, uh, for, uh, for, there's a lot of that. Okay, so I multiply both sides by PF and both sides by CF so I'm getting that uh, PMCM is equal to delta M over 1 minus delta M uh, uh, PF CF. And now I just need to multiply both sides by reciprocal of this to get PFCF, right? So out of this one, we are getting that PFCF is equal to 1 minus delta M over delta M times PM C M. Okay, so from this
it turns out that, uh, that the share of income spent on consumption is constant. Uh, of consumption of manufacturers is constant. But does it mean that uh, customers will always spend the same amount of, uh, and will always get the same amount of good of manufacturers? No, look, because we've got PM over here, which means that if price of manufacturers is going up, it means we can afford more and less uh, manuf uh, manufacturers uh, for consumption purposes. And it goes in the opposite direction. If price of manufacturers would be going down, we can buy more. And look, by the same token, we can get uh, that 1 minus delta M will be the share of income spent on uh, spent on food. Okay, so okay, let's 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 maybe let's write it down. So this is a share of income spent on uh, manufacturers on, on consumption of manufacturers, but. And we've got also that uh, 1 minus delta M is share of income spent on food. Okay, so that, was, that is the first very important conclusion uh, uh, from introducing this type of utility function into our model. We know that those shares are constant. So as you will see, actually the consumption of manufacturers uh, and the ratio of consumption of manufacturers to consumption of food will depend solely on prices of food and manufacturers on the relative price. Okay, so maybe we can now uh, check, and now we can check uh, uh, what what are those uh, conditions here actually mean, or can we somehow put them on the graph? Well, I hope you already know that we can more or less how to do it, but let's do it very small. So, let's start with budget constraint. But we can easily calculate slope of the budget constraint. No. So, look, we want to do it in the space uh, where, so we've got the income can be spent either on manufacturers or on now, we want to solve this for food, consumption of food. This is, let's just say, our new preferred, uh, because uh, we want to have food on the uh, vertical axis, manufacturers on that. Vertical axis, of course, it doesn't really matter because, uh, 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 because we would get the same outcome. But let's be consistent, and let's be consistent with your taste. Okay, so look. Out of this, we get the PF, CF is equal to negative PM, CM plus I. Now, if I divide both sides by PF, I'm getting consumption of food as expressed as a function uh, of the number of manufacturers I'm consuming. find the slope of budget constraint which is equal to negative PM over PF. I hope you can actually notice how similar and actually almost identical here 
everything is uh, everything is uh, in a situation of uh, cost minimization, minimiz minimiz minimization we are dealing with before. Okay, now the second thing we need to find is the slope of indifference curve. Okay, look, a couple things to notice here. Uh, first, uh, in the textbook they call them isoutility lines, which is also correct, but you've been taught you've been taught to use indifference curve uh, for past two years, so I'm gonna stick with indifference curves. Look, what does indifference curve represent? Look, indifference curve represent all the combinations of two goods for which total utility for the customer is identical. So it means that we have once when we are moving along the uh, indifference curve, total utility of the customer stays the same. So uh, our total utility curve as a function of consumed manufacturers and consumed food. If I calculate differential, total differential of this total utility function, I'm getting du equal to du dcm, dcm, right? Change in the number of manufacturers times impact of manufacturers on utility plus derivative of manufacturers with respect to food times change in the consumption of food. And look, because we want our total utility to stay the same, du is equal to zero. And look, all we've got to do right now uh, is to solve it. Right? And look, so uh, again, I want to have CF on the top, so I'm moving this to the other hand side of the equation and I'm getting that this is D U D C F D C F equals to negative D U D C M D C M. Okay, and now all I have to do is to divide both sides by D U D C F. the slope 
of the indifference curve. Now, let me ask you a question. How did we call, how did you call the slope of the indifference curve in your microeconomics class? Yes, of course you're right. This is marginal rate of substitution. Or MRS. Okay, actually, uh, actually, when we talk about marginal rate of substitution, the minus here is not needed, and as you will see uh, in a second, those two minuses will cancel each other out. I hope you can see it already. But look, uh, remember, we, we can we usually call marginal rate of substitution simply. DC, M in our, uh, I'm sorry, F in our case over D, C, M. Okay, and what is it? This is a measure, measure uh, of the ease with which the customer Uh, with which uh, the customer can substitute uh, can substitute one good uh, for another uh, at the margin And still achieve the same total utility. Okay. So look, in a, in other words, marginal rate of substitution which is the slope of the indifference curve, is telling us out of how many units of one good the customer, how many units of one good customer is willing to give up to get one more unit uh, of another good while maintaining the same total utility. Okay, and look, in this case, I would also like to add a co color, colorary, colorary, Oh my god, <laughs> oh no, corollary. Okay, so if customers, if, if consumers take prices of, of the final goods, Utility maximization implies that marginal rate of substitution, which is of course absolute value of this expression, is equal to the price ratio. Okay, so look, what have we got from here? Look, we remind ourselves what is marginal rate of substitution, we find the slope of the budget constraint, we find the slope of the indifference curve, of course marginal rate of substitution, and we see, as over here, that if customer cannot affect prices of the goods, then equality of marginal rate of substitution and the price ratio 
will give our customer optimal. It will give the optimal ratio of manufacturers to food or food to manufacturers uh, that the customer wants. And look, right away we see uh, that with everything that we said this far, uh, we are actually able to make a graph. And uh, this graph can actually uh, uh, help us with establishing and actually help us uh, it can, can actually help us establish uh, the two uh, one of the two most important uh, conclusions uh, from this uh, from these exercises. Okay, so now on this on this axis I'm putting number of manufacturers and here I'm putting a uh, number of food and a number uh, uh, of units of food. Okay, so what do we have here? First, we will have budget constraint. And we see that the customer maximizes her or his total utility at their point of tangents, right? We already discussed this, we, sh we showed this in a different ways, when those two uh, expressions are equal to one another. Now, look, but what is important here uh, it, it, what will be very important actually here to us is to see what happens when income actually increases. And before we see that, Let's first uh, use our equilibrium condition, which is PM over PF, right? Because we could put them with minuses, but minuses would cancel each other out, right? Is delta M over 1 minus delta M CF CM. Look, out of this, I can multiply both sides by CM. And both sides by PF, uh, 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 I can multiply both sides by CM and divide both sides by CF. I can also divide both sides by PM and multiply both sides by PF. And then I'm going to get CM, CF. Okay, and look, you, we can think about it as the ratio of manufacturers to food at optimum. So at the point where customers maximizes his utility. And look, in this specific case, we see uh, that this ratio is a function of prices of manufacturers and food alone. Because those parameters we treat as a job exogenously given to the model. They are a result of some structure of customer's taste. Right? Okay, so that was the first thing. Now, uh, the second thing is, look, uh, the economy's consumption uh, within uh, uh, within this model, uh, in this case, must depend on only two things, right? Because look, consumption of manufacturers and food will depend, in this case, only on prices of food, prices of manufacturers, and, uh, and of course, on income. But look, when we discussed uh, I don't want to go back to it if you if you want more formal proofs uh, you need to go back to cost minimization but look what did we say about the structures of uh, a, about the structure of uh, ease of costs uh, and uh, ease of ones before look 
In this case, if if we, for example, or customers actually has an income that allows them the most to buy two units of manufacturers of food or in two units of manufacturers. If customers' income would double, then we would have another indifference curve. And look, those two distances would be the same. So look, doubling, uh, uh, doubling the, uh, uh, doubling the income would double our total utility. Have we heard this before? Look, those are, this is like the assumption of constant returns to scale. We get it simply because we know that that uh, alpha. Delta M plus 1 minus Delta M is equal to 1, right? Here, it works in our favor because now, again, if I'm going to add additional 2 over here, we'll have, again, the same distance, which means that, that uh, the amount of uh, uh, the, the same distance, which again would mean that in our case, simplify, uh, customer's utility increased by 50%, right? Okay, what does it mean? Look, it means for us very nice thing. This nice thing is that it doesn't really matter what is the distribution of income between the customers? Because look, we can, we will have exactly the same situation if we will have two customers that both have, uh, a, a, both have, let's just say, ten dollars each, or a situation in which one customer has eighteen dollars and the other has just two. Because look, we can add everything up. And because of that, we will be able to build one indifference curve for all the customers uh, in the society. We will call it uh, wealth, but that's, uh, uh, that's a little bit better. And look, where else can we see it? Look, we also said that PM, CM is equal to delta M, I, and look, from this we get the level of consumption of manufacturers is equal to some fixed parameter delta M income over PM. So look again in, in here we see that uh, consumption of manufacturers depends solely on level of income and price of manufacturers. And by the same token, consumption of food is given by the share of food in income, income over price of food. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. In the next video, we will consider a production possibility frontier.